So I'm very excited about today's panel. And um, so I'll just quickly introduce the speakers and then I'll request them to come to the podium. Uh, we have, speaking of speaking to the Ministry of, Minister of Planning, we actually have Dr. Shamsul Alam, Honorable Minister of State uh, for Ministry of Planning. Um, we have uh, Her Excellency Dr. Lily Nichols, uh, High Commissioner of Canada to Bangladesh. We have um, Jason Lam, Deputy Director of Financial Services for the Poor, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have Rani Yanyan, Advisor to Chakma Sarkal and Human Rights Defender from Chittagong Hill Tracks. We have Sharia Caesar Rahman, Founder and Executive Director for Creative Conservation Alliance. And we have Ridwan Hafiz, Founder and CEO of GoZion, a startup online travel agency. So may I request all of you to come to the stage? Thank you. This is a big panel, so we're not gonna take a lot of questions, but I think their answers will be quite uh, sort of substantial. So I will actually start with Jason, because um, Bill and Melinda Gates have been a very old partner for BRAC for, uh, for the longest time. And actually, six years ago, I sat with your Bangladesh officer at that time, Lynn, whom you hired, and uh, discussed this whole idea about how do we promote more digital financial inclusion and what we can do from BRAC through Bcash, through non-Bcash and others. And since the last, so we came up with this whole idea about a financial sort of innovation fund. And that's how it all started. And, and this, I'm so glad that also this Frugal Innovation Forum and various partnerships, and we have come a long way in terms of digital financial inclusion, both within BRAC and also in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, so, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your partnership. And uh, as you heard in the panel in the last couple of days, that financial inclusion came in repeatedly about how important a part of that is in development or humanitarian sector as well. So. We have come a long way, but what do you think are the key areas of improvement going forward in the space? And also, what do you see are the remaining hurdles and challenges based on everything that has going on in the world in the coming days and also what happened in the last two, three years? Over to you. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to take one moment just to thank BRAC. I'm always struck by the quality of the speakers and ideas when I come to your sessions and also the breadth of topics. And so I think you set a, a really nice example for other organizations that are trying to make change in the world. Um, I think uh, I wanted to come to your question and, and really focus on the last couple of years. And I think we can all agree that um, digitization and technology spreading throughout uh, the economy has been a real important change and an acceleration through COVID. And so um, I sometimes say that, uh, that our team at the foundation really benefited from the pandemic because what we were trying to talk to governments about um, before the pandemic about having a digital ID, having a digital payments infrastructure would often fall on deaf ears and now we can't keep up with the demand. Um, but what I, I say that we, we still have a lot to do, and I think in particular we've heard from different panelists about the digital divide, especially for um, women, less literate, and rural customers. And so I think keeping them in mind as this digitization train is, is not going to stop, and in fact it's probably going to accelerate. So I think there are five things uh, that are important. Um, and um, so I'll highlight some of those and some partners that we uh, have been working with in, in Bangladesh. The first, first of all, I think leadership is important. And I think um, your prime minister has set a digital agenda for Bangladesh, first with Digital Bangladesh and then with Smart Bangladesh, that um, helps set the agenda for all the the rest of the government. And I think that's super important. If you don't have that leadership, either in a country or in an organization, then you don't get the collaboration that you need. Uh, second of all, um, you need really the infrastructure. And um, we heard 
um, earlier today from Anir from uh, A2I. We've been working with um, them for, for several years, and they put together um, a lot of the critical components uh, of a digital infrastructure for Bangladesh. And um, they call it the Bangla stack, um, which includes the ID layer, the payments layer, um, the data layer, and the service layer. Um, and I'll stop just briefly on the data layer because I think um, Asif and I were talking, it's, it's something that I don't think that anyone except private enterprise has figured out how to really harness the data and they're not necessarily harnessing it for the public good. Um, and so I do believe that um, A2I is thinking about that data layer and how to, how to use it um, for a seamless citizen experience um, across health, education. Um, I, I wish I had their slide, but there's probably 15 different areas of, um, of society that they're planning to address in the uh, smart Bangladesh strategy. Um, and, and that's super important. So A2I uh, and that, that infrastructure is the second area. So leadership, infrastructure. I think the third one um, is really around, um, let's call it legacy. In, in countries like um, Bank Asia and other large banks and financial services that, that need to innovate and reach to um, unreached populations. And we, we see that with, with Bank Asia and BRAC Bank's um, banking agent, agency network, which has been a really terrific way to reach out into more rural areas. And, but we need more of that innovation from more of the sort of legacy old school players. They need to, to see their market as the entire of the country, not just the, um, the, the gravy that, that pays their... Um, um, the, uh, the, the next thing um, that I think is super important, because women um, are such an important segment to reach, um, knowing how and why women struggle in accessing and using financial services is super important. And we've got a piece of research, um, I'm gonna read it here, called Identifying Women's Barriers and Obstacles in Accessing Financial Services, and three terrific uh, local researchers, um, Dr. Banu, Dr. Herc, and Dr. Uh, Rashid, really a dream team of researchers who are going to be providing that information and that insight so that we can figure out how to better reach women especially in, in rural and, um, and poor illiterate areas. Um, and then finally, we need innovation. And I think the innovation forum here, um, I think the innovators that are happening throughout um, uh, Bangladesh, we, we met uh, on this trip, we met with a, an organization called iFarmer, who's uh, innovating in the, in the agriculture space. And so, we need more and more of that, and I think the infrastructure that A2I is putting in place will allow that, that innovation to happen more easily. So I'll stop there with those, those five things. Thank you, thank you. That was so comprehensive, and you touched on data and innovation, and, and also this morning we heard Dr. Omarishra talked about data as can be game changers for all of us who are working with us, the government, non-government, uh, in terms of way we do design, way we look at, monitor the project. So, I'll, um, I'll come, I mean, do you want to address the second question or I'll come back to you? Do you want to, okay, I'll come back to you, yeah. Because speaking of data and uh, sort of uh, how innovations and startups are changing Bangladesh, um, and to a large extent South Asia as well, uh, I will go to a startup founder. Um, Ridwan. Ridwan Hafiz started as a very uh, digital marketing company which became very successful, Analyzen. And then, a uh, serial entrepreneur as he is, he handed it over to somebody else and he moved on to start up a new online travel agency um, called Gozion. A lot of people may heard heard about them because anytime I go to Facebook, I get 
bombarded <laughs> by digital marketing from GoCyan. Um, but he's the guy, he's the man. Uh, he has a lot of interesting experience about how he pivoted during COVID, their business strategy, and also he has access to a lot of data. And he's also kind of a face of a changing Bangladesh as well. So Ridwan, over to you in terms of how you see this and how you see the opportunity and how you see the change. Well, um, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you and the entire team for inviting me. To be very honest, I feel like I'm very out of place here. These are like the, all the heavyweights in the stage and I like, have the honor to share the stage with you. I mean, not in terms of weight, of course, like in terms of everything. So, but uh, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, just to give you a context for those of the people who don't know about Gozayan, so we are an online travel agency. Think of it like Expedia, but for South Asia, for these markets. So we started in 2017, we were growing, but until you know, like something magical happened that we call it COVID-19, and everything actually like fell apart from our end. Like we were focusing on outbound travel, but that's when we tried to actually, of course, like we were at the end of our cash cycle. We were barely surviving. We barely had any money to put food on the table to have the, the lights on the office. But then we pivoted to the domestic market and only to realize that this is actually like much, much bigger and better market is actually like out there. And people have the affordability to travel, but they don't have the convenience to choose things online and actually like make a very seamless travel experience. And that's when we pivoted and long story short, before COVID, what we used to do, whatever we used to sell, now we do like 20 times more. From Bangladesh, we went to Pakistan, now we're operating Bangladesh and Pakistan, and also like we're going to operate in two other markets in the next couple of months. Uh, we're still very small, very early, but every day we're trying to learn new things and try to how can we actually like make travel more affordable for everyone. Now, speaking of, uh, that's, that's the background of Gozen, but speaking of data, so, there are like, I have been, of course, working with my digital agency background and, of course, now with Gozen, and we have seen some very interesting shift that actually has been happening for the last few years. Just to give you a context, before, like, four years from now, on the urban side, people used to consume four hours, 12 minutes on their phone every day. Now, the number is like four hours, 59 minutes. That's only in the urban metro area, like Dhaka, Silet, Chittagong. Now, Four years ago, on the rural side of it, it was only less than one hour. Now, it is three hours, 59 minutes. So, which means the same amount of consumption, the mobile is actually like doing in urban area, the same amount of, almost the similar amount of consumption they're doing in the rural area. But whenever it comes to like the financial inclusion, whenever it comes to like online payment, that's where the boundaries are actually like different. The numbers are very different. When it comes to making it a transaction online, Urbans, of course, they dominate it when it very, like almost like 95 percent of it. Now, interesting fact. Of course, we see like companies like as you mentioned, like iFarmer, they're actually like tapping into the rural part of it and trying to change the connect the urban population to the rural population and actually like making a positive impact out there. Uh, what we need more is, of course, like, uh, so, sorry, before, before we go there, we also see, like, okay, did you ever imagine, like, five years ago, like, you see, like, you're going to see, like, your food is going to be delivered at your doorstep within 20 minutes. We see a lot of bikes out there, a lot of the people from rural migrated to urban, doing, like, the gig economy. A lot of the things is actually, like, technology is actually, like, changing. And, of course, like, we are very proud of that, that Bangladesh is actually, like, moving towards the future, that we have seen the same thing in Indonesia, in India 20 years back, and now we're seeing the same thing in Bangladesh. But here comes, here, here are like some of the interesting things where I personally believe that we need to work on. Just to talk about like in our perspective, like in the travel, we see like 75% of the, oh, sorry, 56% uh, of my visitors are actually male, which means 44% are actually female. But when it comes to like making the purchase, finally the transaction to book something, book a flight or hotel online, it's 89% male. So even though the females, they browse, they surf, but they are not the one ended up actually like purchasing or they need like somebody else's help or someone else is actually purchasing on their behalf. We took a look in the grocery data in the last few, last few quarters. Do you, I, I'm sure like this will be a surprise for everyone. 80% of the groceries that are being purchased online are being bought by a male member and the family. Now, are you going to tell me that every one of you, like 80% of the male, they cook at home? 
I'm sorry, I'm not going to buy that. They don't. But this tells me, like, we still have a long way to go just to actually like to enable the female population, even in the urban area, to make the, the financial transaction online so that actually they can be dependent on themselves, not to someone else. Uh, one very interesting thing that we are actually trying, and we believe, like, because of our affiliation with BRAC, where we would be able to take more advantage of it, when it comes to, like, travel, uh, we always see, like, people go to, like, within the country, they travel to Cox's Bajar, Hill District, Silet, uh, and Shundurban, and that's pretty much it. And we all have like limited itinerary all our lives. Like we are gonna go to the Cox's Bazaar, we're gonna go to the beach, we're gonna jump into the swimming pool, we're gonna eat a lot, we're gonna take a pictures, post it on Instagram, and we're gonna come back. That's pretty much it. But now, people are actually like asking for more. People are actually asking, what else can we do? We have done that, we have been that. We have been to Cox's Bazaar like three times a year. Now what next? It's not just the sea anymore. Where else can we go? That's the biggest number of queries that we get. Like, can you name us like a new location where there is not enough crowd, but it's beautiful where we actually can grow? And we believe with our partnership with BRAC, we are actually like trying to uncover, we're trying to build more local travel community or like ma making more local travel accessible to everyone. And we believe with our data, and uh, as you said, so as if I like, we do a lot of marketing, but there is a way you can actually like stop seeing our ads, make a purchase. So, and, so <laughs> they're gonna haunt us. So, but yeah, if you, we believe like us with you together because you guys already have the experience all over the country and at the very bottom level, you have seen that, you have known that, you have the expertise. With your help, with our help, maybe together, we can build a better travel country. Hey, come on, look at South Asia. Everyone goes to India, everybody goes to Bhutan, everybody goes to Maldives, Sri Lanka, but nobody comes to Bangladesh for, visit, for leisure, just to visit Bangladesh. But we believe we have the potential, and Gozan, amongst with every other player, we're gonna be the first one to make that change. Thank you yes. very much. <laughs> this is the power of startup and aspiration. I'm, and I think this aspiration is very much present among the Bangladeshi youth. And I, I, I also must acknowledge, also here even in, in the, just like you said, Jason, uh, the digital Bangladesh, uh, beyond that, the digital connectivity. Also, startup community has been also be heavy, heavily promoted by the government as well. So, so I'm, I'm very excited about what's possible, uh, Ridwan. Uh, but at the same time, while the youth uh, has all these aspirations, they're going around, out in different places, adventures are happening, but we haven't really seen the voices of youth uh, so much prominently in terms of climate change activism in South Asia, unfortunately, and, and, and bang in Bangladesh as well. I mean, these are happening remotely. This is a global issue, but there is an exception, and that's where Sharir Cesar Rahman comes in. He is, uh, I, I, first of all, I want to get his insight in terms of why does he think that is, and I think... He represents the youth community here. But at the same time, also tell us about how you yourself are trying to make a difference, particularly in the field of biodiversity, biodiversity conservation. Because as uh, more and more tourists are going domestically, we are also seeing more and more plastics everywhere. So we are also talking about sustainable tourism. So, but what are you doing in terms of conservation as well? Uh, thank you, Asif Bhai. I would lay a bit of uh, context before, and, but before I start, I would like to ask a question to our audience. Could you please raise your hand? How many of you have heard of the uh, animal called pangolin? In Bangla, it's bonrui. Okay, so it's, it's, it's just less than 50%. And here I have a replica of a, a pangolin. It's not the real size. The real animal uh, can grow up to like uh, three or four feet long and about uh, uh, 10 or 15 kilogram, and the word uh, pangolin is a Malayan word which basically means roller. So this pangolin, when it's scared, they don't run, they just turn into a ball, they roll into as a ball. And, uh, and they are mammal, but they're covered with the scales. And the scales have certain demand in uh, Chinese traditional medicine and, and Southeast Asia. And because of the demand, and in Bangladesh, uh, like per kilogram of the scale cost about 500 to 600 dollars, which is a lot of money for a lot of those marginalized people in the in the 
forest dependent communities. And because of the demand, every year hundreds and thousands of pangolin are captured and killed and uh, smuggled to, uh, to China for this illegal wildlife trade. And, and this illegal wildlife trade is the uh, fourth largest uh, illegal glo global trade with about a $20 billion industry. So why am I talking about pangolin today? So for the last two days, we have had amazing discussions on, on how do we move forward uh, post-pandemic. But uh, there is a critical aspect is missing, so, which is how do we prevent the next pandemic? So uh, uh, the genesis of COVID-19 may lay in this uh, pangolin or the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, coronaviruses, which are found in pangolins and many other wildlife like bats, shared the common ancestor with the human coronavirus COVID-19. So, you know, in nature, these wildlife are the reservoir of uh, microorganisms like viruses. And, 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 and uh, these uh, viruses provide certain benefits to the host communities and wildlife, and that's, that's how nature has been built, and that's completely fine. So the problem happens when human, we intervene, and we encroach the forest. So uh, these viruses uh, spill over to humans and causing those infectious disease. And in fact, 75% of the emerging inf infectious disease are caused uh, from animals. They're transmitted from the wildlife to humans. Uh, the Ebola virus, the avian influenza, the monkeypox, and even and COVID-19. So, and in the last few decades, there has been a rise of this uh, infectious disease. So why this is happening? Because we have been destroying the forest, and we have been uh, 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 killing and capturing wildlife for illegal wildlife trade. As it happens, we come contact with the animal and the virus spill over to humans and we disrupt the natural cycle of the, the microorganisms and, and that uh, 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 pandemic happens. So, so how do we prevent the next pandemic is we have and we must and must protect our forest and our biodiversity. And the biodiversity is the basic of uh, the resilience ecosystem. Uh, so when I talk about forest protection or uh, restoration, it's not just about uh, uh, planting trees. So the forest is a complex system which has so many different components like the fungi, the plants, animals, the microorganism. And each, each of them have their own function and they work in synergy. And that's how you know, the, re the resilience of the ecosystem has been built. So, uh, uh, and we have to protect our forest if we want to pro uh, prevent the next pandemic. And I'll share briefly what I have been doing uh, for the last 10 years in Bangladesh to protect and restore our biodiversity. So I run an organization called Creative Conservation Alliance, which is uh, a conservation organization, and I have a, a dedicated team of uh, passionate uh, uh, people who care about wildlife and nature. And our vision is rewilding Bangladesh which basically means to restore some of the species that we, which we already have lost and to basically to repair the function of the ecosystem. So I'll briefly share a case study that we have been working uh, in the remote areas of Chittagong Hill Tracks. So uh, there are the people, uh, the marginalized communities, they depend on the forest resources and you know, they, uh, they depend on the hunting as well. So there are some of the species which is critically endangered, the turtles and tortoises, and they uh, play a crucial role in maintaining that uh, functional ecosystem. So th some of the species have been almost extirpated to extinction because of the hunting pressure. So what we have been doing that, instead of like working against the people, we're involving the, uh, the local communities. We're partnering with the government agencies, the forest department. First we did, we built a conservation breeding facility of some of the species. And, and we are uh, increasing the numbers in captivity and the Second, uh, the challenging part is like, how do you ensure protection that the species are not hunted? So we, uh, we're training the people and uh, employing them as parabiologists. So parabiologist is a term like paramedic. So the people who are not doctor, but they are trained to do certain aspect to, uh, to handle first aid. So similarly, those hunters who have traditional knowledge on the, on, on the, on the forest and nature, we have been training them to do some basic collecting ecological data and to be the conservation ambassador. And these people are becoming the protector. And last year we 
released the first cohort of the species uh, back in the wild about a year ago, and there's a 90% survival, and the species is coming back after 30 years of uh, absence in the area. So uh, uh, that's a briefly, uh, maybe you can, can come yeah, back later. That's great. And why, why, do you have a sense in terms of why the young people, even the Bangladesh being most vulnerable? See, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the conservation aspect is very, very complex. Yeah. So we definitely need the involvement and engagement of youth. Yeah. But it's, it's not just about the youth, it's, and it's a holistic approach. Yeah. We need uh, uh, commitment from the top, we need political commitment, we need investment and uh, involvement of the private investors. So it's, we have to handle holistically, and it's a long-term approach, but definitely youth has its role on it as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Cesar. And uh, speaking of uh, sort of, uh, I mean, I think one of the things Rani Yanyan mentioned in her panel yesterday that uh, the indigenous community actually have a lot of practices that can be taken on and, and taken globally to also solve some of the current crisis. So um, the, um, our question to Rani Yanyan is that, um, I mean, Caesar works in also Chittagong Hill Tracks and something that in terms of how do, how do you see the state and the development sector play a much better role in bringing in these knowledge uh, for tackling the crisis? And, and, and the second question would be that how do, how do we ensure that the most marginalized voice have a voice in not just being a sort of what we call beneficiary in the development system, but more of an active partner in the fight against poverty and equality? Because Bangladesh is moving on, but not everybody is moving on at the same place. Space. Over to you. Keju um, Tambare Asif, thank you uh, for giving me the floor. Um, uh, thank you, Sharia, for pointing out some of the uh, you know points um, regarding conservation and indigenous knowledge. I think I'll get back to you. Um, if I have time regarding that issue. But I think before that, um, I might need to set a little bit of context, uh, development uh, related context, how inclusion ha is, you know, uh, perceived uh, within the development discourse. Uh, and you've just mentioned that, you know, Bangladesh is moving forward like any other uh, countries in the global south is moving forward. But at the same time, we have seen that economic growth is there. It, is, it has increased, but also um, uh, inequity has uh, increased. The gap in wealth uh, has increased as well. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we always hear uh, governments, uh, policymakers, and development practitioners talk about uh, talk at length about SDGs. We talk about uh, leaving no one behind, um, and that has become a flagship uh, development slogan. But we rarely hear them talk about, you know, the commitment the head of the states have pledged uh, on SDG. Uh, is to, you know, uh, to reach the furthest behind first. And I believe that that should be the flagship slogan of the, uh, this era, development era, because uh, that's the beauty of SDG, because it prioritized the need of inclusion to find out who are the marginalized people um, so that their voices can be incorporated in the development discourse. But we don't, unfortunately, in the Global South, uh, we have seen that it has not always been the case. Um, we, we don't uh, see governments taking targeted initiatives uh, to reach those who are farthest behind first. So we are talking about marginalized populations, marginalized sections of the, um, you know, uh, population. Um, but at the same time to do that, uh, to identify those marginalized population, what we need to do is to have um, uh, desegregated data based on of course, based on sex, uh, um, locality, um, you know, disability or ability of those uh, section of the population, um, and also ethnicity. But again, unfortunately, again, that uh, in 
most of the governments in the global south have refused to produce that uh, disaggregated data. But without that disaggregated data, it is difficult to pinpoint, identify which section of the population is lagging behind on which development in index. And without that uh, data, you can't actually uh, initiate any targeted intervention for those uh, sections of the population. Um, also at the same time, uh, inclusion issue. Since I'm talking about inclusion issue, I am talking about rights issue because development, uh, right now we are talking about rights-based development. Uh, so we have to talk about right, we have to talk about uh, uh, inclusion, and when we are talking about inclusion, um, inclusion issues need to be solved politically. And I'm quite sure that many, uh, many of you might feel a bit uncomfortable because I'm talking about politics and rights uh, on, uh, on, on a development forum. Uh, because development practitioners tend to depoliticize uh, the field of development uh, because development is perceived as uh, less of a sensitive topic than rights issue. But I believe that development is um, as political as politics itself can get because the because uh, policymakers, uh, the power holders, they are the ones who can, and practically they do. What they do, they can decide who to include and who to exclude um, in whose expense. So that's why we need to find political solutions as well. So moving forward, what we can do, what the development practitioners can do uh, to solve these uh, greater challenges uh, to tackle poverty, inequality, especially because uh, we are all committed uh, for the SDGs, is to be less conformist. We need to move beyond the rhetoric of, um, you know, uh, service delivery method. Um, and we need to seek, uh, we need to contribute uh, in seeking to find out ways um, to, okay, we need to contribute to uh, how we how we can contribute in, um, you know, finding ways, political ways, political solutions for these uh, development challenges because inclusion issue is something that is very political. Um, and to answer your uh, second question, um, Asif, I. Th I think I, I really need to give you an example because um, I think uh, if I give solid example, it's easier to put my uh, point across and it will resonate with your area, uh, with your indigenous uh, people's knowledge, uh, the place-based knowledge, native knowledge of the people who, uh, who are the, not only the beneficiaries uh, but also um, I, I'm quite certain that you are including indigenous peoples in your uh, conservation efforts. Um, so I'll talk about uh, an initiative by indigenous peoples um, uh, in Chittagong Hill Tracks. It's called Village Common Forest. So indigenous peoples in Chittagong Hill Tracks, we always had this uh, community forest land that uh, villages, few villages will have access to. That will be the source of their water, that will be the source of their food, uh, medicinal plants um, and firewoods, etc. But also, they won't only extract all the resources, but they are also responsible uh, for managing those, uh, that forest, uh, that community forest land. But you know, over the uh, past 60 years, because of uh, 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 internal displacements that indigenous peoples in Chittagong Hill Tracks have faced, starting with the uh, hydraulic dam that was built on our land, and then the political turmoil of you know, uh, whether government would recognize indigenous people's rights or not. There are many more indigenous peoples got displaced. So that traditional knowledge we had, that traditional practice we had to um, manage forests, to conserve forests, it was getting lost 
because we don't have enough land left. We don't have enough forest left. We have encroachers. We had outsiders who were claiming our land. So few indigenous peoples, um, activists um, and thinkers, they started this movement and they started telling about this uh, traditional knowledge to conserve our forest land, this traditional practice. And one NGO, one local NGO, very much local NGO, they started to work with these indigenous peoples. And I cannot stress uh, the significance of the word with, because in most of the cases I have seen in the Global South, and I have seen many in past 10 years, how development entities, not all development entities, but most of the development entities work. They don't work with the people. They don't hear the voices of people. They don't understand the aspirations of the people. So this um, uh, particular uh, local NGO, development NGO, it started to work with uh, those uh, indigenous people's groups who were advocating for, you know, conservation of these um, uh, community, village uh, uh, community forests. And later on what happened is that after a few years, then UNDP picked it up and UNDP uh, scaled up this process. So now we have many village community pro, uh, forests that are demarcated, uh, that have, um, so the government is now in the process of uh, recognizing um, this collective ownership status of this uh, community forest. So why I am telling this, why I have chose this example for this forum is to um, showcase is that, you know, any, any, uh, uh, if you go to any community, any marginalized community, any groups, they have their knowledge. They are the one who knows uh, the ground realities, the ground challenges. They have their own indigenous knowledge, native knowledge, and they may have the solution. That may not be relevant sometimes. Most of the times they are in the modern world. Sometimes it not be relevant, but you cannot take away their rights. You cannot take away their voices. You have to consult with them. You have to talk to them. You have to listen to their aspirations. And then you team up with them and then find a solution for the greater good. And in our indigenous uh, people's world, in our indigenous people's rights movement, we call it uh, self-determined development. And it is inscribed in um, uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I have to tell you that it took us 40 years of persistent activism uh, to get those rights you know, written on a UN um, uh, document. But I, I, I really believe that this self the concept of self-determined development can, is, it's not can, is relevant to any marginalized groups um, and they should be talking about it and development actors uh, should pick it up and think about how you can use that concept for all those communities. Fantastic, thank you. And such a, such a great articulation and, and oftentimes as well intentioned as they are, a lot of development efforts actually miss that, right? So, and uh, I mean, speaking of which, I, let me come to our Honorable, Her Excellency, our Honorable Ambassador, Lily Nichols. Um, thank you, um, Asif, for, for inviting me to be part of this very stimulating panel and for this very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. And, uh, and Canada has been a, such an incredible partner in global development, and particularly also in Bangladesh and also for BRAC. Uh, we, are, uh, we are a strategic partner. And 
uh, as kind of the international aid space is uh, gradually sort of shrinking, um, particularly on behalf of the organization Grateful, because when the UK aid actually moved away, uh, Canada stepped in to become our strategic partner, so which was very, very uh, helpful for BRAC to uh, move, move forward with their development agenda. So thank you for that. So my question is, uh, I mean, I have two-pronged question. One is around this international aid, which is, uh, I mean, will Canada continue to have a progressive development agenda? And, um, and you can switch the order, with, however. And, and particularly, I think what, what I really admire is that feministic development policy agenda that you have. Why is it important, number one? And number two is that, are you gonna continue to prioritize and promote? What are the priorities? I mean, we heard a lot about disruptions uh, in the coming years and this next normal. We have to be prepared for emergencies and challenges and mainly climate change, right? So, over to you. Uh, um, thank you. Um, let me say, first of all, that um, you know, th what Bangladesh has achieved in terms of poverty reduction uh, really uh, is unprecedented. You know, going in, in, a 50, in a span of 50 years from 90% extreme poverty to 9% is an incredible achievement. Um, yeah. yeah. And as Canada, we're very proud to have been that part of that journey um, to have participated in that process from the very beginning, not just in being one of the first countries to officially recognize Bangladesh as a country, um, but from the very beginning, uh, starting to provide foreign uh, food aid at the time. Uh, and, you know, Canadian international assistance has evolved with as Bangladesh has developed and as the needs of Bangladesh have evolved. And the main premise has always been to support Bangladesh the, on, on the basis of their needs. And it's been a partnership for us. Um, and BRAC has very much been a very important part of that partnership. But over the years, um, you know, our cooperation has evolved from food aid, small infrastructure projects, Later, it expanded into new areas, agriculture, started later providing support to basic health service delivery and health and education, and then, of course, support to some of the country's amazing and world-renowned NGOs, uh, you, know, you know, renowned for the models that you introduced the world to, in women's empowerment, microcredit, and we're very happy to say that we, we, we BRAC being a, a major part of that, and we're happy to say that we accompany you through that journey. Now, today, um, Canadian cooperation um, has followed uh, that, that important focus of, you know, building capacities of national organizations. It, it's not about Canada, it, it's about Bangladesh at various levels, um, turning those into real genuine partnerships, listening uh, to people's voices, Focusing on the most vulnerable groups, uh, be it, you know, migrants, uh, tea workers, trans populations, um, indigenous communities in the Chittagong Hill tracks. So focusing on those groups, making sure that nobody's left behind. And as, as you mentioned, in the case of Canada, um, having a very, very strong feminist approach, um, which I think in the past few years has completely transformed the way that, that Canada works. And the premise of, of that feminist approach is essentially that, you know, women's rights, and yes, it's, it's a rights approach, a, a human rights-based approach, women's rights, women's voices, uh, opportunities, uh, support to women's organizations, that these are essential uh, to eradicate global poverty and to build a more peaceful, more prosperous, and more inclusive world. So if you take that seriously, it's a transformative agenda, and it's about power relations. So yes, it's a political agenda. Uh, and that is the way that, that we interpret um, our approach. Now, in terms of um, you know, what happens when Bangladesh uh, graduates into middle income status, which is happening uh, very quickly, 
I, I think that what happens is that the way we work is what changes, right? What we focus on maybe changes a little bit, but mostly the way we work, I think, evolves. And maybe I can just say a few moments to say about how the what and the how uh, could change. Um, in terms of the what, I think that um, the key premises of international Canadian cooperation, as I said, will depend on Bangladesh's priorities. But we are looking at new areas. For example, one area is climate change. Uh, you know, climate change is a huge risk. I mean, you, we've heard that from the panelists today. Uh, you know, Canada and, and uh, Bangladesh are very, uh, you know, at risk to climate change for different reasons. You live in a delta that is, you know, flooded, and we live in the Arctic cap that is melting, and we're right at the bottom of it. So we both have an interest in addressing climate change issues. Uh, Canada has committed $5.6 billion dollars to supporting climate change, adaptation, and biodiversity. And we're exploring right now ways in which we do that here in Bangladesh. So that, that's an area we want to work on much more. Um, the second one is technical vocational education. And I know that you were discussing that this afternoon. I think that, you know, Bangladesh has achieved so much in terms of um, formal primary education. 83% of, of children complete school in Bangladesh. Yes, of course, the quality always needs to improve. But Bangladesh can really do probably primary education on its own. Uh, so what we're thinking about is um, technical vocational education for youth, uh, preparing uh, the next generation uh, for Bangladesh's um, you know, post-COVID economic future. What are the skills that you will need? And I think here's something where we're really trying also to combine our development work with our commercial work, trying to create uh, synergies. Um, the third area that we're really looking at is innovative finance or what is sometimes called blended finance because as you become middle income there will be windows that now exist for LDC countries that will eventually close. They will, they will not be accessible. So you've got to start thinking how do you use ODA to leverage other forms of funding and there's Canada has become uh, one of the world experts in this area, and there's lessons learned, there's a lot of innovation happening in this space, and very interesting ways of using private sector and markets uh, to create social impact. So the what are areas that are always evolving, we're looking at those jointly with our partners. But most importantly, if I just may close by saying, you know, how the way you cooperate in a middle-income country is very different from the way we might have cooperated with Bangladesh 50 years ago, right? And here, I think we're, we're talking a lot among ourselves as, as going, going beyond the project, uh, going beyond narrow sectoral silos, and focusing much more on, you know, coalitions, networks, policy influence. So not just focusing at the micro level, but going up to the meso level, amplifying uh, so that you're working at policy change. So in a middle income society that has achieved the level of development that Bangladesh has, you know, duplicating services or duplicating the government is not the way to go. They don't need that. But it's more like, you know, taking what policies need to be enforced, uh, what oversight mechanisms need to be there. You know, how do you make the society more just, more equal? And looking at who are the players, the change agents in society that, that we could work together with. So for us, I think, and I think for Bangladesh, the future has to be about advocacy coalitions and, and, and transformative change. Absolutely. Very succinctly put, thank you so much. Particularly, I would say that some of the words that, music to my ears is the word, first thing you mentioned there about localization. Whether it's in climate change, whether it's um, in Chittagong Hill tracks, I think locally led approach has to be prioritized. And this is something that we are promoting as well. Because oftentimes, even though countries allocate big money, but it's often gets uh, mired in bureaucratic structures. Um, I'll just give you one example, Green Climate Fund. It's a, we heard about it quite a bit, and we applied for it for four years ago. 
nothing has come in, and we don't even know where the structure is. So these are the challenges for local, I and mean, this is BRAC as well, this is the large organization, and I can't imagine what organizations of CESAR or organizations that Rani Yanyan talked about, how they are uh, sort of struggling for sort of the resources as well, right? So I think this is so important. And, and thank you, and this is, brings me for all the sort of, uh, I think, important development gains Bangladesh has you know, over, over time made as well. So I, I think this brings me to our honorable state minister who has been very integral part of this journey and, and can take a lot of the credit for this because he, before he became a minister, he was with National Planning Commission for a long time. I think you were the longest serving member, right? <laughs> probably. But, uh, but uh, so, so he has been a very important part of this journey. And, but at the same time, the governments all across the world uh, are in the hot seat now uh, because of all these uh, other challenges that are coming up. So my question to you is twofold. One is that, A, in spite of all the crises and challenges, um, what are the opportunities do you see as well? And the second thing is, are we ready to kind of face the coming sort of crises that are coming up? And how do we forge a broader partnership between government and all this network coalition that uh, Honorable Ambassador mentioned uh, between other actors, the social entrepreneurs, private sector, nonprofit organizations? So it's a slightly broad question, however you want to answer it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, <coughs> I, sorry, I thank the co-discussants with me. <coughs> sorry. Uh, so far, we heard about you no know, micro aspects of development, how we can go with you know uh, inclusion of marginal people in the financial no, uh, inclusion. Now you have asked me a broad question. Uh, we have a huge challenge ahead, of course, uh, because of COVID you know, infestation, COVID manifestation, or COVID fallout, and uh, Ukraine, Russia, war fallout certainly uh, brought the whole world into a turmoil, big turmoil, certainly uh, economically in all other, encompassing all, the, all other sectors, social, environmental, everywhere, this will have impact, no doubt. And uh, the global financial turmoil, how actually, we are going with preparing uh, climate adaptation, uh, you asked me. Uh, first of all, I would say in managing COVID, Bangladesh uh, uh, has been doing well. Uh, this is you know, uh, said by uh, Nikkei Institute, perhaps. They have reported that Bangladesh is uh, one of the five countries uh, which uh, has done well in managing COVID. And Bangladesh is the first country in South Asia in managing COVID. So how we managed COVID, uh, COVID fallout or COVID situation or COVID challenges. Of course, we, we passed very trying times over the last two years and a half. But with good planning, with good incentive packages, you uh, know, for uh, private sector exporters, for you know, businesses, for micro, small, medium enterprises, uh, government had incentive packages to boost up their activities and economic activities, and also uh, for financial inclusion. Uh, seeing, you know, uh, we had to close down our offices uh, altogether 66 days in the first year and the second year altogether. And uh, that actually created, uh, for the time being, you know, many people fallen uh, below the poverty line because of job losses, 
because of disruption of economic activities due to lockdowns and all, all other no, uh, related things. But as I said in Sam that we did well in managing uh, COVID situation. But that has no, uh, increased to some extent our poverty level for the time being. Uh, I should say three to four percent that had increased the number of uh, poor people in our, our country. And uh, certainly when we are mm, uh, coming up with you know, economic resilience, again, uh, since the uh, last February, uh, we are facing, whole world is facing another turmoil in terms of uh, Ukraine-Russia war. So both these shocks actually impacted uh, prices, so much prices of essential goods, and uh, that uh, certainly will again impact uh, falling of many marginal people uh, to the poverty trap, no doubt that, no doubt about that. But in terms of, you know, uh, managing the climate situation in our country, Bangladesh, uh, I, I think, foresaw uh, the climate uh, fallout that uh, is being emerging, you know, because of temperature rise, and Bangladesh is one of the disaster-prone country as of IPCCR report, you all know. And uh, to address that, to address climate change, adverse impacts, we prepared a 100-year plan. And that is basically combining both, you know, mitigation and adaptive, you know, measures uh, suggesting there. Uh, we prepared a 100-year plan, we call Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100. <clears throat> uh, that was prepared considering, considering the whole country uh, into six hot spots. I mean, each hot spot is you know, characterized by its uh, hydrological differences, climatological differences, you know, temperature, rainfall, variation. Each hot spot, I want to say, uh, has specific characteristics of uh, no, climate uh, impacts. So we prepared, uh, uh, we first developed strategies how to solve uh, hot spot wise problems. We suggested measures, uh, we suggested action programs, and uh, in a broad picture scenario, if I say, uh, we emphasized actually more of adaptation and, uh, um, and uh, certainly uh, that uh, they are, we said, how to, how to go with, you know, mitigating temperature rise, how we can help people, make them resilient and adaptive. And that was a plan, I think, well devised, well designed how we handle climate issues, particularly how we face up uh, no, water scarcity in the dry seasons. In our country, dry season is from November to, say, April, May. So during this period, we, we, we face shortage of water for agricultural activities in many areas. And we face flooding in cities. We face flooding in the countryside. So for all these, actually, we suggested measures, uh, broad measures. And uh, I should say we emphasized uh, nature-based solutions. First of all, we tried or said in a way that uh, we can uh, degrade our natural resources. Uh, so that need to be stopped. Uh, we need to make pure water available for human consumption. So we actually prepared, I should say, 
ahead of many countries, particularly disaster-prone countries, we prepared disaster management strategies. Uh, and for that, you all know, Bangladesh is one of the country uh, which can be, you know, uh, referred as model for disaster management. And uh, so, in climate adaptation, uh, to help climate adaptation measures, uh, we are preparing national adaptation plan by Ministry of Environment. And to handle climate change issues and having more action plans to handle climate change impacts, we, we, we prepared Mojib Prosperity uh, Climate Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, like that. So, what I want to say, we really, uh, we are bothered about climate change issues because that will impact, you know, livelihood in many ways. That will impact our agriculture. So, we prepare ourselves to meet uh, as far as possible on our part, making a knowledge-based, you know, action-based plan for Bangladesh. So this is with how we'll be preparing, how we prepare ourselves for adaptation. And uh, you know, Bangladesh uh, coming up with uh, programs of agroforestry in a big way. Though we, we are losing a bit dedicated forestry, uh, no doubt, uh, but agroforestry or social forestry or homestead forestry uh, has come up in a big way. Every village you will find uh, now, lot of wood trees, fruit trees, you know, and uh, I saw never before so much, you no, know, uh, trees in our country on the roadside. Uh, and many of the croplands now turned into, you know, forestry, I mean agroforestry. So that was not seen before. So in that way, we try to mitigate, you know, climate change issues. We try to mitigate, you know, carbon emission. So Bangladesh is a different country in terms of agroforestry and, uh, if I say, homestead forestry. Uh, in huge way, if you go in rural area, you will see trees and trees in many areas that we never saw before. So Bangladesh is in a right way to handle, at least I should say, though not in a sufficient way, but certainly we are in a right way to handle our climate change issues. And the second part of your question, how can social entrepreneurs, development partners, private sector work with government more effectively? So the way is, Another government from the beginning, since inception, we allowed private sector activities uh, giving more than, giving more leeway than, a, time passing, we gave them more facilities, uh, more uh, no, uh, ways to come up. While after the independence, you see, of total budget, 85% 87% would come from the public, you know, as check you are. 70% uh, only come from private sector. Now the situation has reversed. When I led the preparation of h 5 plan at that time, 87% of total investment in this country you know, comes from private sector and only 70% comes from uh, tax finance you know, budget. So how that uh, we make you know, possible? Because gradually we emphasized uh, private sector more, and private sector including the NGOs, you know, and uh, social, uh, social entrepreneurs also. So Bangladesh is a country uh, which actually emphasizes a lot the role of private sector, including NGOs, social entrepreneurs, businesses. And uh, even in these you know, uh, trying times of uh, you know, COVID fallout and you know, war fallout, if I say, this year also, uh, over last, uh, you know, 
quarter, just last quarter, July to September. Private sector credit uh, has expanded 14%, uh, which is very encouraging, I should say. I mean, uh, you all know and see that uh, uh, how we are managing uh, very efficiently our macroeconomy. Uh, over the last two decades, I should say, uh, we had very prudent macroeconomic uh, management. We had very deft macroeconomic management, no doubt about that. So we are dealing in a very efficient way, relatively efficient way, of course, because we have been doing very well in terms of managing our economy. And uh, that's why we are able to make our country a no, developing country. We could make our country a lower middle income country. So, and uh, for greater cooperation of private sector and government, certainly we would, and for, for facilitating private sector, you know, we went with so many, especially economic zones, uh, like China, China, no, growth began there with the uh, establishment of uh, special economic zones, particularly in southern China. So Bangladesh has been emphasizing a lot for that. We are, we are preparing to establish 100 special economic zones. Uh, of that, 15 already is going to be completed and others will be, you know, gradually will be in implementation. So, in, in, in belief and by, you know, commitment, we are supporting private sector very much. And that is one of the big reasons that we are doing well. And we make the country, we, we have been trying that to make the country an export-led country. When you go with export-led, you need to import, you, you need to allow imports also. So we'll be, uh, we'll be depending more on exports and import in the coming days. And that export would come from the private sector largely, and import certainly by the private sector largely. So in this way, there is good partnership uh, between private and uh, government, I should say. So I think having more uh, discussion, discourses with private sector, and uh, private sector and development partners also should be more you know, aware of the plans of the government. Government uh, has planned for five years, Government, you know, has planned for vision plan for 20 years. We have planned for 100 years, so they need to know these plans, you know, uh, very much to to devise their own, you know, plans, activities. So in that way, I, was, I think we can force better partnership for uh, for for continuous development of the country. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And exa that's exactly what we did from Bangladesh, uh, BRAC's operation in Bangladesh, that when we did our strategy, we looked at the five-year plan and, and worked how we can play a complementary role. So really appreciate uh, your thoughts on this. And, and I think I, I just want to end the panel in a, in a note where kind of we started the conversation I was talking about collaboration. And also, a lot of times people do ask me that in this sort of changed environment, what is going to be BRAC's role is, uh, in Bangladesh particularly? Um, I think there are a couple of things. One is that BRAC will continue to be uh, staying relevant as our founder has wanted us to be. And that by staying relevant means that with the changing nature of the society, the country, there will be their different type of problems that will be emerging. And we look at ourselves as a part of a solution ecosystem, working with government, private sector, development partners, social entrepreneurs together. So BRAC will be doing exactly what we, we are doing now. We'll be sitting in the middle. We are working side by side with the government, private sector, development partners, nationally, globally, and change makers. So uh, on that, and this is, I, I asked everybody that what excites you the most. 
Uh, so I will end with what excites me the most. This is what excites me. The collaboration because beautiful things can happen uh, when uh, all of us work together. So on that note, I want to really thank all our par par panelists for a brilliant session. And I really appreciate also Honorable State Minister for joining us and, and giving his thoughts. And to all of you for kind of making the last two days so special. Thank you very much. <laughs>